So, uh, good afternoon, everybody. Hopefully, uh, following Dominic's rather detailed explanation of how to design power amplifiers, I'll uh, try and take us to a slightly different and more systems approach to how we want to use equipments. Um, so, I've got to cover quite a few uh, areas. Um, basically, a little bit of explanation about space and telecommunications for people who may not be familiar with it. Um, sort of some of the terms we use on satellites and wh what's in them. Uh, a little bit about uh, frequencies and links. Um, a little bit about what's going on in the communication uh, products area I work in, what we make. And then some examples of where we use technology and the benefits and challenges we, we, we encounter. Uh, the picture on the, on the left is a, a nice example of the sort of thing that we, we produce. Uh, it's what happens from a geostationary satellite, in this case uh, a UTIL sat satellite, KASAT, uh, and it's producing a, a series of spot beams over, over Europe. Um, and it's really all about how we actually make that happen. So just a bit of, uh, a bit of information really. Um, as of about April this year, there's around about 1,886 operational satellites in orbit around the Earth. Uh, and of those, you'll see uh, more than half are actually to do with communications, either commercial communication or civil or military communications. And uh, you can see also in the top left corner um, is an indication of different types of orbit we talk about, low Earth orbits, medium Earth orbits and geostationary orbits. Um, predominantly, um, a lot of satellites are from the US, or Russia, or from other areas. So in terms of the market that we're operating in, um, the satellite communications market is a rapidly changing one at the moment. And the market's evolving, and certainly uh, we're keeping a very close eye and involvement in what's going on in 5G and the low latency type systems. Um, one of the things that we find is that there's a, a massive demand for very high throughput, very high capacity satellites. Uh, and that means we're having to produce more complex payloads. Um, more and more of our satellites have, have onboard processing. And we're moving to more active array antenna systems. And we're also having to have higher bandwidths to achieve this capacity, to get terabit capacity. So we have to go to higher frequencies. But on the other side of things, uh, as people be aware, uh, we, we're seeing reducing costs for launch. People like SpaceX producing uh, reusable rockets. Um, and of course, the, the kind of buzz phrase of the moment, constellations, new space, um, small platforms. Um, but all of these uh, are requiring a more modular approach with more capacity and functionality and size, weight and power. And, and very importantly, uh, we're very focused on what is the cost per, per gigabit that, we, that uh, we have to improve. There is one other point I should make, and that is that there is coming along things like high altitude platforms. Uh, so in Airbus, um, we, we have uh, very fortunately a, a platform called Zephyr. And uh, in fact, in July this year, uh, Zephyr S uh, achieved just shy of uh, 26 days uh, in, in, uh, in flight. Um, which makes it the longest duration flight that's ever been achieved uh, by a self-powered solar solar uh, uh, vehicle. Um, but it's, it requires very small, very efficient components to be on board that, uh, that, that unit, which is not very far from space. Um, people often get a little bit confused about dimensions. I thought it was useful to give some idea of, uh, of, of the sizes and things we're talking about. So, Low Earth um, orbiting satellites are all basically in, in uh, a, a, an altitude uh, of around 2,000 kilometres, which at the bottom there is essentially the, uh, from here to Sicily. So they're orbiting uh, in, in a region from here to Sicily, and they're going overhead at something like 7.5 kilometres a second. If we move further out uh, from, uh, from the Earth's surface, uh, we, we find where the uh, navigation satellites sit, GLONASS, GPS, Galileo. And then finally we come out to around 36,000 kilometres, which is the geostationary location, 
and that's where all the geostationary satellites sit, and obviously they're sitting uh, in a position that's relatively fixed to the surface of the Earth. Space, I have to say, is a, is a horrible place to be. It's a very challenging environment. And it's challenging because getting there, for a start, is not simple. Um, if we actually look at the problems of the first launching, there is an enormous amount of vibration and shock that goes into a launch. Um, particularly for uh, a, a telecom satellite or, or, or a non-manned satellite. Um, the, the levels of shock and vibration for non-manned launches are quite high compared to what happens for a manned launch. So you, you've got lots of physical vibration, lots of shocks. Uh, when things deploy, there are explosive bolts. Uh, there are also very, very high sound levels uh, at the beginning of launch. And when we test satellites, they actually have to go into big chambers with huge walls of project sound at them and everything is actually subjected to intense sound. Of course, having successfully got into orbit, um, we find that space is not so nice either, um, apart from the fact it's more or less a vacuum. Uh, we've got radiation. Radiation is an annoyance because it tends to uh, rather mess up any electronics that you've had from the ground. In, you know, when we're here on the ground, we design things and generally we're not too worried about radiation, but in space it's a problem. So we have to concern ourselves with what's going to happen to parts in space, particularly due to uh, radiation belts near to the Earth, cosmic rays. If we're out at geostationary uh, uh, orbits, we have to worry about um, single event effects caused by uh, heavy ions. <coughs> and the other big issue, when this is something that often people get confused about is temperature control. Um, because the only way we can control the temperature is really by, uh, by, by radiation and conduction. So we have to move the heat around the satellite. Um, and so you always find that people say, oh, we need very efficient uh, equipment on satellites. And they often confuse that with the fact that we may not have enough power. Actually, for most satellites in orbit around the Earth, power isn't a problem this big shiny thing and it creates lots of power. We can get the power. The problem is if the circuits we use um, aren't efficient, we generate a lot of heat. So typically, as a rule of thumb, um, a, a satellite overall is about 35%, 33% efficient. So that means that two thirds of the power has to be dissipated as heat. And that's, uh, that's quite a problem. In terms of what happens on the satellite, um, there are a number of different sorts of satellites and it's the payloads that are the key part and they do the hard stuff. Well, that's what we think anyway because that's, <laughs> that's the bit we're involved with. Um, but they range in, in sizes. There's a lot of interest in things called CubeSats which is shown at the top left and these are uh, basically based on, 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 on the 1U uh, dimensioning. Um, uh, but then you move up in size um, to something less than 500 kilos um, or to large, so large satellites typically which is what a, a, um, a large geostationary telecom satellite is, something up to towards 10 tonnes uh, or, or possibly ultra large satellites which you would be able to put up on something like a Falcon Heavy. But the critical point for telecom satellites is, and this is a, a, a phrase that was used by someone in the States not too long ago, is that they are basically money-making machines. They convert photons to money. Uh, so if you're an operator, it's a wonderful thing. You buy this satellite and you, you launch it and it goes into orbit and it deploys its solar panels and you get this free energy then and then you send signals up and money comes back down. Um, and this is, this is really <laughs> what they're interested in. Uh, in terms of uh, what, what, what's in a satellite, well, very simply, most, most satellites historically uh, for geostationary have to operate for at least 15 years. Um, in reality, they operate longer than that. Um, the thing that actually can generally can, uh, limits the operational life of a satellite is, in fact, the propulsion system, because you're always flying a satellite. You always have to keep it on station. And obviously, if you run out of fuel, then... Uh, just before you run out of fuel, you either have to put it into a, a, a graveyard orbit or if it's nearer to Earth, you have to make sure it will deorbit. 
Uh, so that's what usually limits the life of a satellite. More and more we're trying to move to uh, electrically propelled satellites because that gives us um, a more efficient solution. It takes a bit longer to get to orbit, but it allows you to um, actually have bigger payloads as well. Typically for some of our large satellites, we have a basic uh, power level of between 15 and 20 kilowatts available. Um, and our payloads cover things like TV direct broadcast, is the historical area, uh, obviously mobile, multimedia, and, and military communications. And, and there's a list of some of the basic parts. This is uh, a picture taken in our assembly integration clean rooms in Portsmouth, uh, showing a typical uh, satellite to give you a sense of scale. So this is uh, about two metres by two metres uh, along, the, along the bottom, and it can be up to six, eight metres high. Uh, the hole you see at the bottom, near the bottom in the centre there, is where the shafts would go through, and onto the ends of which would be the solar panels. And this is just really the payload section. This will be shipped off, and the antennas will be added to the top decks, um, and, and we'll add the propulsion systems underneath. In terms of satellite communications, um, clearly uh, we operate a number of frequency bands. Um, these range due from UHF or VHF uh, low frequencies for military applications, but most of the areas we're interested in are for fixed satellite services, uh, mobile services, and um, also things like navigation systems. So typically we, we're operating from L band um, in S band, C band, X, right up into KA, up towards 30 odd gigahertz. And more and more for the high capacity systems, we have to operate in the higher frequency regions. I put this in because it just gives an indication of the sort of signal paths that we're having to deal with. So if you're starting from an Earth station, um, you transmit and it leaves the Earth station with about 79 dB watts power. And then you've got a huge loss as you transmit out to the uh, satellite. And so we receive it at the satellite with sort of something like minus 134 dB watt. We then have to actually amplify the signal, um, do what we need to do to it, and then retransmit it back out. We have the path loss back down to the ground, and then maybe you pick it up via your dish on the side of your house, and it goes back into your, into your TV receiver. But getting those link budgets and allowing for things like the effects of rain fade, weather and everything else is a critical factor in designing a system. So I mentioned the fact that we're in communication products and this is, this is really what communication products in Airbus does. Um, these days everything, we, we look at everything centred around what we call the digital uh, processor, uh, digital telecom processor. Because more and more, as I said, everything's digital. And then, so we have coming into the, uh, the, the uplink side, we have low noise amplification. Then we will do pre and post processing, which is basically frequency conversion, which takes us down to a level we can then operate through the processor. Once we've processed the signal, we'll then up convert it, oh sorry, we'll or up convert it further, but to a lower frequency than it came in at. And then we'll go out usually these days through solid-state power amplifiers uh, into an antenna or an active array. Around that, we also require things like master reference oscillators, master local oscillators, the heart, the timing of the satellite. Uh, more and more as well, uh, we have to have uh, uh, encryption systems for the telemetry and the command, um, and even on the data. Um, people will try and hijack satellites if they can get into the telemetry systems, so you have to uh, have encryption. Um, we also need, as we have processors, we need processor control systems because now it's a quite complex thing to operate. We also have frequency beacons so that when you actually have a satellite you can locate it uh, in the sky uh, um, and point to it. And we still also produce what I call analog uh, processor systems, so these are more complex uh, analog uh, frequency adjustment capabilities. And so on the left is a list of the types of things that we actually make and produce. Interestingly, um, one of the things that we've done for many years is we manufacture our own quartz. We do that in Stevenage, 
Um, and that's because we have very, very high purity quartz, uh, which we use in our oscillators. And the reason we need very high purity quartz is because if you have uh, impurities in the quartz, in the radiation environment, it degrades. Um, so you really want nothing in there to degrade the performance of the quartz. These are the sort of things we make. Typically, they're gold or black boxes. <laughs> we like gold and black. Um, well, we see they're black because of it helps with heat radiation, uh, and gold because we just like to make them expensive. <laughs> uh, but <laughs> <laughs> and it also te tends not to rust, although that's not such a problem in space, but it's the bit getting there that's the big problem. Um, so you can see here, uh, uh, here are a range of our processor families, our amplifier products. Um, some of our advanced products uh, from the RF point of view in the middle, uh, frequency parts and, and quartz parts. And we, we, we design and produce these uh, in Portsmouth and in Stevenage. So what are the blocks that we typically see in a payload? Well, something that everybody's going to be very familiar with in this room. Uh, we'll come in through an antenna, we'll have some, some filtering, some amplification, uh, then we'll have some uh, frequency conversion, uh, some more filtering, and in a conventional uh, uh, bent pipe payload, that would be what you'd have. You'd, you'd come in at a high frequency, convert to a lower frequency, and then send it back out down again at a, low, uh, a slightly lower frequency through a power chain. Um, that's been the model for, for, for payloads on satellites for a long time, and that still is there. But more and more, uh, satellites, as I said, becoming digital. So what do we find? We find that this is what's happening more and more in terms of what's on the satellite. So we come in as usual, we have an amplifier, and then we'll go through uh, an ADC, into a DSP, out through another DAC, uh, and then out of the chain. So it, it's, it's, it's very much where do those boundaries go? So the RF boundaries and the digital boundaries, the digital boundaries are moving further and further out towards the antenna. However, in the analog world, you still end up having to have uh, an, antenna, an amplifier and an antenna uh, at, at, at those ends. We still need to make these frequency conversions. So here's, a, here's an example of, of what we call pre and post processor frequency converter. So typically, uh, what we've got here is, is, is a post processor. So this is the, the, up, uh, the, the converter that goes frequency up from the processor. So we come in at the left uh, through some filtering, some slope adjustment, some anti-alias filtering, some amplification here shown as a silicon germanium block. Um, some thermopads to control um, the, the actual performance uh, of, the, of the game block into a, um, a mixer, up converter mixer block. Uh, out of that, and then we come out as a downlink. And then we have a number of these units which we put onto a base um, plate where we can train the, the control electronics, and, uh, and the, on the left you see the power supplies. And we can put a number of different units onto this plate. Uh, to allow us to actually um, convert a, a range of different frequencies if necessary. So that's a typical example of the sort of units that we would employ. Uh, and that would feed into processors. Now our processors, we've been working on processors for many, many years, um, starting back in the, in the late 80s. Um, We've got processors in orbit on a number, well, a large number of satellites, uh, started with InMarsat 4. Um, so all the InMarsat 4 satellites have our process on. These were quite large structures. I mean, they're about, about this, this long and this wide and this deep. <laughs> um, whereas our more recent uh, uh, Generation 4 processors are about the size of, of, uh, of an A4 book and about this thick. So that you have quite a difference in size. And in terms of, obviously, capability, these are hundreds of times more powerful. Uh, and uh, in the latest processors we're now working on are going to be uh, even more powerful, again, to get this high throughput capacity. I mean, what the processor does, essentially, it's like a telephone exchange in the sky. It allows us to take the, the signals, split them out, redirect them, route them round, and then send them back down to either appropriate beams. 
And then in the future, uh, which is one of the things I look towards, where will we go next? And uh, there's a question, whether it be <laughs> very deep submicron type technologies. Quite a key area is gallium nitride. We use gallium nitride now quite a lot on satellites. We use them mainly, in, obviously, in power amplifiers. Um, so very recently, uh, we, we launched Novasar S. Uh, that went up about a month ago. Uh, that's actually got a gallium nitride power amplifier on board of it. Um, uh, that's for remote sensing. Um, we're looking more and more at active array transmit antennas. And again, we're looking at using gallium nitride. And also, very importantly, we're using gallium nitride to improve the efficiency of our DC to DC power conversion. Because again, it is all back to the same problem. We want to improve the efficiency and reduce the heat uh, that, that we're actually having to generate, uh, lose uh, in the system. So GAN's got a number of applications, not just at RF and microwave, but also in high-speed switching circuits in DC-DCs. So why, why is GAN a useful material for as well? It's, it's got a lot more efficiency um, compared with gas. Gas is typically 35%. Liam earlier in the day uh, talked about amplifiers around the 30% figure. Um, in fact, with uh, gallium nitride, we, we, you know, we can get 50% or better. And obviously with that, we can either trade the efficiency with mass or we can increase the payload's capability. Uh, and improving the DC power regulation is also quite critical. So what I've done here is a very simple example. Uh, let's assume that we were going to produce an active array which was 510 watt transmitters. Um, and we had a 95% uh, efficient DC-DC converter. And so we've got uh, PAs at 10 watts. So we're producing 5 kilowatts out. Um, now if we've got a satellite uh, that's got a, uh, a 20 kilowatt capability uh, and the efficiency of this whole system is, is around uh, 35 percent, then what we see is that we're actually generating uh, uh, about 15, ki uh, 15 kilowatts of heat to get 5 kilowatts of power out. If we can push the efficiency up, move to the right, towards 50 or 55 percent, then in fact the amount of heat we produce is much less, so we can be down to only maybe five kilowatts of heat and we'd only need a, 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 le a lesser level of power on the satellite. So that's one of the, really the basic reason we need to, to use things like gallium nitride. However, gallium nitride does come with its challenges for space. Um, thermal management, as I say, is a key problem and of course, as it said earlier, you, you get lots more uh, heat flux out of the gallium nitride device, the peak heat and average heat flux is very high. Uh, that's a problem for us because the only way we can move the heat from under the device is, is via heat pipes. And if we have too much heat flux, we boil the heat pipes. So we have to spread the heat. So that's, that's a design challenge. Uh, we have other issues, which is things like multi-paction, which is we get, to, if we put the RF power levels up and we get to connections, here we see a connection between a, uh, an ISO circulator and a track, we can get multi-paction effects. And quite importantly for gallium nitride, we have to be very careful about memory effects. These have got a lot better, I have to say, over the years, but you still have to look carefully at to make sure... Uh, what the GAN device does in terms of any memory. And, and all, all GAN devices have that effect. Some have less of it and some have more of it. Um, of course, if we are able to use higher half powers, we have to worry about what happens to the people working with it when we're actually building or testing. So we have to take more care in terms of human exposure. And of course, if we're going to operate at higher voltages, then we have to start worrying about the safety implications of the voltages that we're applying to these units. So again, we have to look at interlocks. And of course, very critically, the commercial challenges, price, supply, assurance, and export controls, these are all critical factors to us in the space business. Uh, but so price is obviously <laughs> critical to us in all businesses. However, GAN has got a lot of benefits. It's actually a lot more radiation robust and hard than, than gallium arsenide is, which is great news. Um, 
So we've done a lot of work over the years evaluating gallium nitride and we, 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 we establish things like the safe operating area subject to heavy ions and, and it's a lot more robust than, than, uh, than traditional gallium arsenide. Uh, in fact, these days, normally I talk to people and I had a conversation about this very recently with someone and uh, they're getting very well concerned about using gallium nitride and I said, well, the problem isn't uh, reliability of gallium nitride uh, because in fact it's at least, as we see on the next slide, um, it's probably a factor of 10 or more better than gallium arsenide. Um, it's actually uh, all the other parts that will fail. So the gallium nitride will be great, it'll be still going. Everything else will have gone wrong, but not the gallium nitride. You've got more worries about your, uh, your, your DCDCs and, and all, your, all the other parts. Um, but, um, but there's a lot of work has to go into looking at the qualification of a, of a part for space. Mainly because people get very upset if they spend a lot of money launching a satellite and then it doesn't work. I don't know why, it seems to, seems to annoy them. Um, we don't usually have that problem, but uh, uh, of course what we do in order to avoid that is we test everything uh, almost to death before we launch it. And we accumulate enormous quantities of uh, data which we carefully store. And uh, we do this because it satisfies the insurance companies. And, um, and then we do very little with it because you know, nothing goes wrong very often. But in the event something goes wrong, we look at the data and we say, well, there's no reason why it would go wrong. <laughs> so just pay the insurance. But, uh, <laughs> but um, that's, that's the space business. But that is changing because if you look at the, uh, the, the, the constellation business, people are prepared to take more risk. Uh, it costs less to launch. The lifetime of the missions is getting less. Uh, and so people are looking more towards uh, using parts that are maybe upscreened from the automotive industry. That's really where we're trying to go. So we're trying to move away a little from what we used to do in space to try and make use of things like automotive. Uh, and uh, obviously all of these things are a trade-off and channel temperature is a good example. So when Dominic was talking about modelling uh, GAN, it's a critical thing for us trying to make sure that we don't uh, exceed the channel temperature. And in space, of course, we have an extremely conservative channel temperature um, compared with what gas, GAN can actually achieve. Uh, but uh, that, that's, again, part of the reliability question. We've put up a number of uh, SSPAs. Um, Alcomsat 1 is an example. That's in orbit. It's been running for, for um, most of this year. Um, we've done a lot of... Uh, uh, SSPAs for navigation, um, a lot in the uh, GLONASS system. Um, we've got amplifiers going into the UTILSAT uh, 5 West B satellite and another one that's just coming along. And at the moment we've got uh, about, well, we're doing IMOSAT 6, Flight 1 and 2. Uh, they, that's, an, uh, an, that's an active array. So there's 126 SSPAs per antenna. Um, typical performance that we achieve um, from these amplifiers is shown in this table here. Really what I want to show you is um, the fact that if you, if you actually look at the bottom, the power added efficiency at the operating point is, is, is this is the overall uh, uh, SSPA. This includes the, power, the uh, DC-DC converters. In this case is around uh, 53 or better percent efficient. So that's real benefit we gain from having those uh, GAN, GAN devices. And that's, that's from measured parts that are in orbit uh, at the moment. So in summary, um, what I've hoped I've done is give you a bit of an idea about what we do in Airbus, a little bit about the market, about where things are moving, um, how we're looking at both uh, 5G and how that could go into space, uh, and also low earth orbit and geostationary. Some of the challenges that we have to address with these devices uh, in terms of the uh, performance and the sorts of platforms and some of the things we have to worry about when we do it. And uh, that I think was it. We've got time for a few questions. Yeah. Um, what's the design lifetime for 
one of these satellites and what's, what do you actually achieve operationally? <laughs> okay, well, uh, typic well, a typical geostationary satellite has historically had a minimum lifetime of 15 years continuous operation on orbit. If you're in a lower orbit, um, they tend to be, depends on the orbit, uh, 7, 10, 10 years. Um, in terms of what do we achieve, uh, well, from an engineering perspective, it's very good. We usually achieve far, far more than the, than, than the minimum time. Uh, as I said, they normally don't, nothing, they don't wear out. It's, it's, it's if they've run out of, uh, if they run out of fuel. Uh, from a business point of view, they're awfully overly engineered and it's a disaster. They should have failed at 15 years and one week, but, <laughs> <laughs> but that's another matter. <laughs> yeah. You haven't mentioned anything about time approval for uh, satellite systems. <coughs> Since I have no perspective on it, is time approval for satellites, is it harder than terrestrial comms or is it easy? Okay, well, yeah, well, well, by type approval, yes, we, we, we have to meet, we do, we have to meet the ITU regulations uh, that apply, so we, we, we have to, yes, we have to make sure that we only transmit in the bands that are allocated, we only transmit at the right powers, we certainly can't have signals going into other bands, and you have all sorts of complications because you've got astronomy bands, um, you can't interfere with other people's uh, frequency allocations. So yeah, there's a lot, a, a lot of our design work is in trying to make uh, perfectly square filters to make sure that we don't transmit outside the band. Uh, so yeah, there's a lot of measurements that go into ensuring that. But each satellite or set of satellites tends to have to be measured and you have to show that they are, they are not going to, uh, uh, they're, they're not going to interfere or, or be outside of the requirements. That is, that is absolutely vital. I mean, the other challenge we see now, and uh, this recent example, in C-band, for instance, we've got satellites up there covering a lot of portions of C-band. And in the States, of course, uh, the FAA has just recently agreed to let some of the C-band be used for 5G, um, <laughs> which then brings you into a whole raft of other concerns um, about what's going to happen where you've got 5G systems and, and how they might interfere or you might interfere with them. So, yeah, the whole regulatory issue is very complex, and you're absolutely right. But it, it's harder than to get type approval for a satellite than, say, terrestrials? Well, we, 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 it's not quite the same as when you say type approval, you're thinking about like a handset or, or, or something like that where you have to show. We have to actually show that we, you know, the, the satellite, by, by test that before it's launched, that it won't interfere. Uh, but uh, so we wouldn't be allowed to launch if it did. And that is, <laughs> yeah, I guess, part of the paperwork train <laughs> I mentioned. Before anything gets launched, uh, you have to be, everybody has to be happy that it's not going to cause a problem. I've got a selfish one. So how long did um, MRSAT-3 hang in there? Oh, gosh, I'll, I'll, I'll be honest and say I couldn't answer that off the top. Sounds positive then. <laughs> uh, I, I, in my sat three, I think it. I, I think it. I think. I think in Mars, I think it's been. I think it's I think we've decommissioned in Mossat three, but it. It was probably, and I'm. I'm guessing, but it was probably twenty years. Uh, I, I. They norm. And I think because you you hit it on the head there. You said they were heavily over engineered. Yeah. At the cost of deaths for engineers. <laughs> yes, this is this is true. The. <laughs> Yeah, that, that is absolutely correct. There is, there, is a, there, is a, there is a correlation to be had between the, uh, the number of engineers that survive and the length of the satellite. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I've got a question as well. I saw a horrific graphic this week of how many dead satellites there are out there, which is hundreds of times more than the 1886 that you... Uh, no. Yes, you're referring to the problems of space debris. Space debris, yes. Yes, space debris is a big problem. Uh, and is, 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 is a concern to the industry. So, of course, today uh, you cannot launch a satellite unless you have uh, an end-of-life uh, policy for it. So if it's in low orbit, you have to be able to show how it will deorbit. If it's in uh, geostationary orbit, you, you, are, you have to allow enough fuel to move it 
to graveyard orbit. Um, if you have, as we've got, things that can go wrong, um, there's a lot of work going on in the industry to look at how we might send up space tugs or things to help deorbit pieces of junk. Um, and that is a big worry, yeah. It's an industry concern because it, yeah, you, you can rapidly, there is a, I forget the name, but there's a cascade problem that is known, well known, it can happen. Yeah. 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 Interesting. Anyone else? To what extent are you making use of derated commercial components in place of space qualified components? Um, more and more is the answer. Uh, that's because we are, we are, we are very, well, we're, we're, there's a number of reasons. In, historically, the space industry kind of emerged at the time that the semiconductor industry was evolving, so there was a, a tendency to test everything very thoroughly. Obviously, the, the semiconductor industry is very mature now, generally. We have a lot better understanding of statistical behaviour. Uh, the space industry is kind of catching up on that. It's not been good at statistics because there tend to be small numbers. But the, the need to get the costs down and the need to go to things like these uh, constellations is, is pushing people to uh, use lower cost parts. Uh, the only way you can get lower cost parts is that you, you basically look to um, use available parts and either up, 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 up rate them uh, or, 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 de or, de or derate them to some degree to, to the environment. So as I indicated a moment ago, a good, set, a good area for that which we're kind of focusing on generally is clearly um, military type parts or, or automotive parts because automotive parts are, with the exception of I'll say very broadly, but with the exception of radiation, automotive parts are very good. Um, so if you can start from something like that, that's where we're trying to go. Um, so what you're seeing now are people bringing out um, uh, radiation um, tolerant parts. So these will be parts that aren't radiation hard by definition, but they will be measured to some level of radiation and then it's all a matter of looking at what the use is and what the environment is and, and how that will work. But yeah, th but that is, that is happening, and, but it's driven by this cost. Uh, and a lot of these constellations that are being looked at, it's a, it's a cost modelling exercise because there's many, many constellations being talked about and we're involved with a lot of them, but it's a chicken and egg question. You, know, you need a few billion to put up a constellation. So the starting point is, uh, well, I'll divide my 300 satellites into a billion and I, I need a satellite that costs 10K. Or, you know, <laughs> and then you know, make us a satellite for 10K. Oh, well, how are we going to do that then? <laughs> uh, so yeah, then you, you, know, you iterate around the loop. And that's a lot of what's being looked at. Well, with the rating and with the, with the um, satellite technology changing, how much is redundancy uh, part of satellite design today compared to years ago? Okay, um, well, redundancy is, is always, we always put redundancy into satellites. There's always some sort of redundancy on a satellite. Um, with uh, small constellations, it's a slightly different logic to the redundancy, yeah, because there you might say, well, actually, if we lose one, we'll, just have, we'll have some others that are on standby or we'll put up some more. It's this cost trade-off. If it's in geostationary orbit, uh, it it's still costs you to get it there and uh, you, you want, you don't, A, you don't want it to fail, and if it does, you need a redundancy system on there. So we still, have to, we still put in redundancy. So we always have sort of three for two, two redundancy at least. Um, and sometimes we'll put up systems that are very reliable, but we'll also have a parallel system that's kind of more of a test system to kind of look at using uh, less uh, well-known parts and see how they go. Yeah, but good question. Okay, that's great. Thank you ever so much. Thanks.